motor control used to be easy, right? I just got myself a motor, hooked up two wires to whatever battery just happened to be laying around, and poof! (laughs) Big puff of blue smoke. Ah, dang. Okay, maybe not that battery. Guess we should be paying attention to voltages here. Okay, new motor. Hook up two wires to a battery with the correct voltage, and whee! Okay, no, that was backwards. Swap wires. Okay, now we. <laughs> that was really about it, right? Now, though, we've got brushless motors and microcontrollers and FPGAs and characterization models and equations and software and design verification, and it's pretty tricky. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Today, custom motor control involves math. And who better to help us out with that than MathWorks, the experts at math. My guest today is Eric Segan from MathWorks, and we're going to talk about building custom controllers for processors, FPGAs, and SOCs. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more about building custom motor controllers from MathWorks. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, hi, Amelia. Yeah, thanks. Uh, happy to be here. So before we start talking about motor control, you guys do something called model-based design, right? That's right. That's a really good point to make because that's really the basis for why we're heavily used in motor control. Model-based design starts with an algorithm, ultimately. Where that really comes from is based on research that I might have done or through requirements that I've obtained for this new design or respin of existing design. From there, I start off doing my design using simulation. I build up models using the components of my system, the overall environment, but key things having the algorithm within that. Using simulation, I can predict how it's gonna behave before I ever lay my hands on hardware. Cool, okay. From there, I can generate code in different forms, C, HDL, and so forth, for targeting my real hardware. And this is a great way for to validate my algorithm ultimately in hardware. And finally, we give you the ability to use that generated code, whether it's in test systems or in production hardware. We have integration we've done with IDEs from different vendors to make this whole process as seamless as possible for you. Through it all, we have robust test and verification environment, so you can prove out at each level of design that you've matched the specs that you had at the higher level. Okay, cool. So I think I get the model-based design business, but how does that apply to motor control? Yeah, we got away from motor control here already, haven't we? (laughs) So let's go ahead and take a look at how this really fits into a control designer's point of view if they're doing motor control. Okay. First of all, we have a lot of off-the-shelf models of different types of motors, power stages, and so forth that are heavily used in motor control and drive design. We also have a whole suite of tools for control system analysis, I can linearize and so forth, and I can also do control design, use different control structures, do optimization of gains, what have you. We also have a test and verification environment so we can prove out using simulation, whether that be within the simulink environment or in conjunction with HDL simulators or hardware, but we can verify our generated code. Okay. We have the code generation that's going into all these different targets, whether they be microcontrollers, DSP chips, FPGAs, ASICs, or even SOCs. And finally, we have this integration environment where we've integrated tightly with tools from TI, from Xilinx, Altera, NXP, and other providers. All right, Eric, let's dive in and see how this runs. Okay, yeah, enough PowerPoint. Let's get into uh, doing some real MATLAB work here. Yeah. So this is actually still on PowerPoint. Oops. But <laughs> <laughs> but this is actually our, our block diagram of the system we're going to be working with. Okay. And we'll dig into it more as we really do get into the demo. Okay, so let's bring up the demo here. This is our uh, system that we're going to be uh, simulating here. So we'll hit the play button, and this is going to be a, a field-oriented controller. Uh, with, we're doing velocity control. And we're actually running the simulation now. We'll bring up the results here, and we can see how this is operating. Uh, you can see from the, the velocity waveforms on top uh, that uh, we, we go through this initialization phase here. We're actually calibrating the encoder. And then two seconds in, we do a step. Uh, you can see that the, uh, uh, the pink is the actual response, and the blue is the commanded signal. And then here, you can see the different modes we go through through this controller. So we start an open loop. We then have to find the index of the uh, encoder. Uh, we calibrate the encoder, and then we go into this closed loop regulation mode. We can dig into the plant model here and get a better look. You can see we have this uh, PMSM model motor and a disk load. 
and uh, we have uh, an encoder and a uh, A to D here to read the uh, currents we're driving, and then a model of the uh, peripherals uh, here, the uh, PWM and inverter. And on the controller side, we see the multi-mode controller here. We'll dig down into that. Uh, and ultimately within this, there's a state machine that's running in our state flow tool. And when we can look at the uh, current controller when we go into final regulation mode, and we'll dig down in there and every controller designer wants to see where are the gains that I'm gonna be compensating, right? So we'll go ahead and dig into that. Here's the, the D channel. And we can see here's the proportional gain and over here's the integral gain. So that's what a control system designer would be tuning, uh, whether in simulation or in hardware. Okay, Eric, simulation is great, but demos are demos, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess we really need to prove it out with hardware or else it doesn't really count. So we're, we're gonna go ahead and do that. And we're gonna be doing that using a different tool here than we've used before. On the upper left here is, of course, the, the design we started with. When it comes to hardware testing, we can throw out that motor model because now we're gonna be replacing that with real hardware. So you can see in this model on the lower right, we've replaced the motor model with these orange blocks. Those are part of our Simulink real-time product that essentially gives you a whole set of I.O. drivers that you can use with target hardware, like the Speedgoat hardware from our partner Speedgoat. So here's the, our controller model that we've, we've retained from the previous simulation. It looks just like what we had before. And then you see these orange blocks that represent the uh, I.O. drivers and uh, what we'll do is we're gonna build this system. That means we're gonna generate C code in background, compile it, and build an executable with these IO drivers uh, built into it from Simulink real time. And we're gonna go ahead and bring up the hardware here. And there it is. There's, uh, we'll just move that over to the side here. And over on the left, that's our Speedgoat box. It's an x86 based uh, uh, real time computer. We've got our uh, cables to our IO boards. And what we're doing is taking all this code that we've compiled and created an executable from and have it running on this box. Uh, you see via cables, we're connected ultimately to this motor with that spinning disk on it. Phew. All right, so we're gonna use MATLAB to, to kick this thing off uh, and run an automated test. And if you watch carefully, you'll see the disk spinning there. Oh, there it is. Yep, so that's going through the same sequence that we did in simulation. So of course the question is, do they match? So we're gonna upload the data into our Simulink Data Inspector. And we'll plot out the velocity that we showed before. It looks pretty similar, right? Um, so we're gonna go ahead and, that's the commanded signal, that's the, those, this is the test results. Let's see how the simulation overlays with this. So we'll just bring that up from our previous run and drop it onto the same slide. So you can see that they're really, pretty closely agree, even through this whole encoder initialization phase. Yeah. Uh, and once we get over into the step change and we're in closed loop mode, they, they match really close, so we can zoom in a little closer and you see the slope is pretty close fit. Uh, we could probably do a little bit better if we worked at it, but uh, that gives us a lot of confidence that our simulation model is matching what we're gonna get in real hardware. So uh, Eric, what does the workflow look like here? Yeah, let's uh, take a look at that now that we've kind of gone through it with a different view here. We start off with the algorithmic C code that we separated out from the motor model and the drivers. The drivers got built in with the generated C code, and we downloaded all that into the Speedgoat real-time computer that's x86 based, and that's where we were able to run the test. Okay, so we've talked a lot about processors, but what about our SOC FPGAs? That's right. This workflow worked really great for Speedgoat. It would work for C2000s from TI and other kinds of devices. But yeah, with FPGA, we bring in another level of complexity. Yeah. The demo I chose to go through with you today actually uses this set of hardware from our partner, Avnet Electronics Marketing, has this Zinc Intelligent Drives Kit 2 that builds on the previous Zinc Intelligent Drives Kit 1. Okay. <laughs> and uh, let's get a look at that hardware. So what we see here on the upper left, that's a, a Z board. On the upper right, that's actually an FMC module that's made by analog devices that has all the drive electronics that we're going to be using. It's also where you attach that little gray cable that's going to have our encoder signal where you can see the other end of the cable is attached to the encoder on the back of the motor. And the motor is coupled to another motor that's acting as a dyno. We're just actually going to tie together the leads on that so it's going to be a passive load, although we could control it if we wanted to. And then we have this coupler between them. That's going to be what we're going to be able to see actually spin. Unfortunately, we don't have any disc spinning on this part of it. Nuts. <laughs> 
So Eric, how is the workflow different for SOCF PGAs? It's very similar in fact, but what we do is we start off with a separated out controller between the C and HDL. We've partitioned them out in advance. And then we go through an IP core generation workflow where we use our HDL coder product to generate, in this case, VHDL. And that gets built into this Vivado framework. And on the C side, we can generate the algorithmic code and again, use a reference framework, whether that be the Linux framework we get with Xilinx or VxWorks from WinRiver. And from those, we can go ahead and target the actual embedded systems. In this case, is Zinc Intelligent Drives Kit that's working with the motor and the dyno hardware. Okay, so we've got the part of our design in software and part of it in the FPGA fabric. How do we divide that up? That's a good question here. So what we're going to do is start with what we had before. These were all the components of the controller that we were looking at in the previous case. And what we're going to do is take the parts that we need to run the fastest, the I.O. processing and the current controller, and we're going to assign those to the FPGA, keep all the other parts as they were running on the processor. And we also replace, of course, the drivers we had before with peripherals. In this case, these are provided with this kit, and we can kind of build and go. All right. So, Eric, how does this look like in a demo? Okay, let's go ahead and get it started. So, again, we'll start in Simulink here. And uh, here's our model. We'll go ahead and start to hit the play button, get that running. And uh, we'll bring up the, the waveforms here. So in this case, what we see is uh, we have a, a mode we're showing on top. Uh, and the velocity sequence we're going through is the second curve down. And then the third curve down, we're seeing actually, again, the mode of the controller that we're stepping through. Now that we've actually run the simulation, let's go ahead and uh, go through how we would take the next steps in code generation. And as we said before, we're going to start off with IP core generation. So it's kind of drilled down to the IP core. This is where it's going to be. And we can start a tool we have called HDL Workflow Advisor. It's part of our HDL Coder tool. And it really sequences the steps it takes to uh, build an IP core. First, we choose the target. So in this case, we're targeting uh, Zinc. But we could target uh, other targets like Altera SOCs. And here's this is where we actually set up the target interfaces. So this is how we connect the IP core to the rest of the system, to the IO pins, or to the AXE interconnect. From there, HL, code, HL Workflow Advisor helps you uh, make sure that your model is ready for code generation. And then we can actually set up the options for the kind of code we generate, whether that be VHDL here or Verilog. There's a lot more options to customize to match the coding style that uh, I prefer. And finally, we have this step here that lets us name the IP core, build it into a repository that's shared. Uh, lots of options are available here. This is actually a report here. Now we can learn more about the IP core. First, we can see that the resources we're consuming it hasn't really been optimized, but this gives you how those are distributed through the core. And, and we have this documentation we produce here of the IP core. So here you can see all the uh, port names and types. And we can actually see, you know, let's move the, the model here next door so you can see how these correspond between the port names on the left and the actual core on the right. We'll keep scrolling down here. There's further details provided, including a, a user guide. This gives you really just handy documentation on how the core is going to work. And then we even give you instructions on how you would use this core with Vivado IPI. Uh, let's take a look at some of the generated code. We'll look at the actual uh, current controller. So we'll just open this up a little bit and scroll down. And as you'll see, the code is, is nicely written, nicely documented, and the signal names uh, and, and wire names correspond uh, to the actual Simulink model. If we click on uh, these tags, we actually it will bring us to the model. And likewise, we can browse back from the model to the code. All right, so we're done with that part now. Let's go ahead. How, how would we build this for actual the target hardware? I'm not going to go through this because it would make for this to be a little bit of a longer uh, talk, but we can actually go through all the way down through building a bitstream and programming the board uh, through this user interface. Very cool. Okay, so now that's taken us that far. The next step would actually be running it in hardware as we did before. Okay. So as we did before, we want to keep the core controller and really throw out the rest of the the model, right? We don't need that motor model. I'm going to use real hardware. So here's what we have. We'll go ahead and start this run. Now this is running external mode. So it's actually compiling, building, and it, we're going to, it's going to let us run the same sequence of tests that we did in simulation. 
So we'll go ahead and bring up the scope and there's our hardware down in the lower right. So what's going on behind the scenes here, but ultimately you'll see the motor spin here on the lower right as we get waveforms on the upper right. So this is all giving you a lot of feedback on what's going on because when motors are involved, you, 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 you want to make sure that you're, uh, you're operating correctly. So we'll go ahead now and upload all this data back into Simulink as we did before. And uh, we'll start off again with the test data and we'll look at rot rot rotational velocity and phase currents. Those are two uh, signals we, we care deeply about. And we'll go ahead and bring up the results from simulation and overlay those. So as we saw earlier, we have pretty good agreement. There's going to be a little bit of difference up front in the initial phase because the initial conditions will be different. But you can see there's pretty close agreement between simulation and actual uh, experimental results. Very cool. Okay, Eric, can you recap your main points for me? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, we've, we've gone through a lot in the course of this time, right? So what I would point out here is that the whole idea of model-based design is to be using simulation to do design work. And the thing we showed here that we were able to get good agreement from doing calibration with tests, and now we know we built confidence in our simulation model. We're able to validate, in this case, on prototyping hardware. Maybe this is something we could talk about in the future, but we'd be able to target production hardware as well, take the generated HDL and C code and bring that into a production system. Cool. We also showed how we had a common controller model and we had the ability to take that controller model and partition it for hardware and software, but we really maintained the same control model throughout. And so Eric, uh, where can I go for more information? Well, as it turns out, we set up a specific web page, mathworks.com motor control, and there you can find lots of resources. There's lots of information on different products that we talked about today, including HDL Coder, Simulink Real-Time, and others. We also include a bunch of examples that you might be interested in running, including the very example we just ran here for Zinc, but also for other targets from TI, Altera, and others. And finally, we offer information on third-party products here that are suited to motor control, such as the Zinc Intelligent Drives Kit, such as this motor control development toolbox from NXP and many, many other tools. Very cool. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Eric. Thanks a lot. And before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can find out more information about building custom motor controllers from MathWorks. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal, or check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com. <laughs>